Okay, so good evening and a very warm welcome to all of our intellects and thinkers and a warm welcome to our friends from the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation in South Africa. My name is Akaita Alfred and I send you warm greetings from North London tonight. Now, as you know, tonight is a night whereby we join you with a tinge of sadness and a fairly heavy heart because it is the official finale of the Pan-African Pantheon Lecture Series for 2021. A series that has taken a critical look at the most prominent prophets, poets and philosophers in Pan-African history. Can you believe that we started this series on the 23rd of June? The 10 sessions have absolutely flown by so fast and I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's been an incredibly rich and fulfilling exploration. On a personal level, I thoroughly enjoyed reading all the different chapters and just doing the pre-work that goes into actually hosting these lectures. It has revealed so much to me about the nuances and the divergences in Pan-Africanism and Pan-African thought. And it really highlighted the fact that they're all valid and all necessary for the total liberation of Africa and her people across the world. So perhaps this week we can do something a little bit different. I'm not going to ask the first timers to tell us where they're logging in from. I'm going to assume that everyone here has been to at least one of the previous lectures. Uh, what I'd like you to do this time is to just share one or two of your highlights of the series. So what has been the most memorable lecture or simply an aha moment for you? I know that's a tough question because we've had some incredible speakers going all the way back to Andy Knight on Dudley Thompson, Lee Daniels on Malcolm X, to Sir Hilary Beckles and Barney Pitiana on Black Consciousness. I know how unfair and how very difficult it is to single out one talk. We can't forget Colin Grant on Garvey and the last session with Vladimir was amazing as well. So yes, it's tough to choose, but do try to drop your, your comments into the chat and let's share with each other one more time. As you do that, it would be remiss of me not to give a very special mention to the man whose work on which this series stands. That is, of course, our comrade and good friend, Dr. Adeke Adebarjo. On behalf of Nigel and the Centre, we want to say thank you for trusting us to coordinate the series and to bring your work to our members. We personally believe that one day, someone, somewhere, will be writing about you, just as you've written and compiled with so many. It's been an honour and a privilege to work with you and the team We've only worked with 10 lecturers, so we can only tip our hat to you for assembling such a stellar lineup of global African intelligentsia to produce such an incredibly an incredible and timeless body of literature on Pan-Africanism and Pan-African thought. We may ask you to say a few words at the end if you're in position, but as we say, we offer our sincere thanks to you and your team at the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation. It's been a brilliant night. So let's get to your comments. So let's have a look at what any of you have said. So Nigel has said, my highlight has to be Colin's session on Marcus Garvey. That one will live long in the memory and the conversation was so powerful. Uh, also said that he loved Dudley Thompson as well. Does anyone else want to share what their favorite moments have been? Whether it's a lecture or a particular piece of information. So we've got here uh, Professor Hilary Beckles, someone's mentioned that one. Uh, Steve Biko and Marcus Garvey, thank you, Carl. Uh, Lorato said, hi everyone, it's a difficult one. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, my highlight though, I have learned a lot on Amy Ashwood, same. Definitely agree with that as well. Does anyone else want to mention a moment that they've particularly enjoyed before we get back to this evening? Uh, Shaquille? I thoroughly enjoyed the Marcus Garvey lecture also, really appreciated learning about his life and experience. Definitely, definitely agree. Thank you so much. So, oh, someone else, Nigel. How can we forget the discussion on American black patriotism with Lee Daniels? Absolutely. Uh, Pearl Robinson, I went on YouTube and found three videos. None had Garvey speaking in his own voice, disappointed. Okay, I'm sure there are a couple of links I've seen in YouTube with him speaking. Maybe if someone knows of any, they can drop them in the chat. We can have them up afterwards. Uh, to Zil, I said the best for me is Amy Ashwood. 
uh, learning about the Garveys from you, Nigelson. I've got you, Pearl, I've sent you now. Thank you very much. So, uh, powerful to read some of your thoughts. I have to say, and I'm sure that Nigel wouldn't mind me saying this, uh, we do sometimes reread the chat after each session. We obviously get lots of feedback emails too, uh, and at times we've been blown away with what the series has meant for so many of you. All we can say is thank you. It is a pleasure to be here each week and to see you show up and enjoy the content. Our commitment is to education, a Pan-African education, so nothing fills us with more pride than seeing all of our intellects and thinkers. You have been incredible, so thank you very much. So right, it's a shame to move on now. I forget we actually have a lecture that we need to listen to and what a lecture we have to close. So our guest tonight is author and media and communication specialist, Nomsa Mamuka, who is here to talk to us about the life and times of the inspirational, the mercurial, the sensational and formidable Mama Miriam Makeba. What a way to end, what a way to bow out on a truly global Pan-Africanist who exported Africa, the African struggle and African culture to the world. None other than the first African on the continent to win a Grammy, a songstress and a lyrical provocateur in my eyes as well. Nomsa's work focuses on African art, culture, education, and socioeconomic development. She has curated, facilitated, and contributed to various events and festivals, including the United Nations Development Programs, Unite to End Violence Against Women Film Festival, uh, African Synergy Artist Exchanges, and the Southern African International Film Festival. She is the co-author of Makeba, the Miriam Makeba story, and a co-compiler of the anthology Township Girls, the crossover generation, which we will post in the chat as well. So without further ado, let me hand you over to tonight's guest speaker to take the series home for the next 35 to 40 minutes before a conversation and Q&A. So Nomsa, if you're there, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. And um, thank you to everybody um, who's, you know, who's tuned in tonight. Um, yes, it has been an exciting past few weeks. I really thank the organizers, you know, for the opportunity just to talk about the lecture, uh, just putting together the lecture series. And of course, I'm really honored and humbled to have been part of um, the book. You know, I was very excited to have shared to have had the opportunity to work with 36 you know, other writers, to share our diversity of voices, experiences, and histories. And of course, you know, just the opportunity to have Miriam Makeba represented with other great female activists is really, really something that excited me beyond a doubt. Um, I, I think I think, you know, I've always had a feeling that women aren't, you know, so the fact that um, Miriam Akeba is part of this anthology, you know, alongside women like Amy Garvey, Ruth First, uh, Maya Angelou, uh, and it's very exciting. So thank you, thank you again. Thank you to Prof Ade for editing and putting it together. Um, before I go into my bit, um, I really wanted to say that, you know, just every opportunity I get to talk about Mama Makeba is really so emotional. It really takes me down memory, serious memory lane. You know, memories of talking, laughing, you know, crying, <laughs> eating food. Um, and this is while we're working on her, biology, on her biography. And, you know, another exciting thing about having worked with her is just the opportunity she gave me. You know, I remember when I first spoke to her in 2002 about saying, Mama, please, I'd really love to write your book. You know, the first, her first reaction was to laugh. Ha ha ha. She was like, write my book. But then afterwards, her, her spirit, her, her energy was like, why not? Why not? And her why not was really on the principle that she said, we are black and we are women and we should tell our story. So that's how my journey began. So I'm sure she, if she was here, she'd be very excited to know she was part of the anthology. 
and that so many people are sitting here tonight ready to listen to, to hear his story all over again. So thank you to all of you. Um, well, as we all know, Miriam Makeba was about music. So to get us going, what better way to do it than through song. <laughs> Guys, I present Miriam Makeba. Hi, Nonsa, are you playing the, the music? Because we can't actually hear anything at the moment. You can't hear anything? No, no. <laughs> I heard something very faintly, but it's not, it's not quite loud. It's not loud enough. Oh, so sorry about that, everybody. Um, tech will do its thing. She was Always. playing very well. <laughs> but I uh, hope we can pick her up a bit later in the presentation. Sure. That was Miriam Makeba opening up the session uh, with Pata Pata. I'll try and make sure that the rest of the audio works better as we go along. But just to get into it, I'll start with a bit of background on who Miriam Makeba was. Um, Miriam, Miriam Zenzile Makeba was born on the 4th of March in 1932 in a place called Prospect Township in Johannesburg. She was the last born of six children of a Saswati woman named Christina Jela, who made a living cleaning homes of white families in Johannesburg. Zenzile's father, Kazwa Makeba, was a teacher who dabbled in music and unfortunately passed away when Miriam was only six years old. After Caswell's death, Christina obviously had to keep on working to look after her family. And so Miriam Zenzile, which was her Kosa name, was raised by her, matern her maternal grandmother, Mavila Kazi, in a home where there were 20 other grandchildren. As a result of this upbringing, Zenzile grew up with an appreciation of the spirit of extended family, community, and communal living. And I think these are the values that she carried throughout her life. Uh, you know, life was very tough for the Makeba family, for them growing up, but music and singing was very important. Ma Vila Kazi, you know, sang traditional African songs and Christina loved to dance. She played the Congos, Congo, Congas, drums and the mouth organ. From her elder siblings, especially her brother Joseph, Miriam was introduced to the jazz music of greats like Louis Armstrong, the Mills Brothers, Ella Fitzgerald, and that's how she really got her exposure to music. But the most important thing about her journey into music was that she learned it wasn't only about entertainment. It was something, a powerful tool that she could use to cross, to cross borders, language, class and culture. Fortunately for Zenzi, because of her ability to sing, she sang throughout school, in the community, you know, and at church. She also learned to sing traditional ancestrals. Her mother answered to a calling and became a sangoma which is a traditional healer. In many African countries, you know, uh, people receive a calling from their ancestors, which is, you know, which gives them the powers to be mediums or to be healers. And this is what uh, Christina became. Because of that, because of her mother's new calling, uh, Miriam dropped out of school when she was about 14 or 15 years old. 
And her first job was working as a housemaid and the laundry woman. And that's how she was able to earn a bit of money in her life. In the mid forties, um, knowing South African history, you know, uh, South Africa has always had a contested history um, politically and socially. But in 1948, the Africana and based National Party came to power and they introduced a system called apartheid. Of course, apartheid was about segregation and um, separating white and black. Many laws were introduced which left black people, the indigenous people of the land, deprived of their human rights. This affected many people. And of course it affected Zenzile's family too. But because she was gifted and was able to sing and had a talent to sing, she, she managed to get into singing and to leave the life of domestic work. First performing with her cousins in local, local centers and at community events. It was while doing these performances that she caught the attention of one of the most popular all male black bands in South Africa, a group called the Manhattan Brothers. The Manhattan Brothers loved her. In fact, the first night they had her out on show, the leader of the band said, Miriam sang like a nightingale. And of course that was written about in all the newspapers. After meeting the Manhattan Brothers, Miriam began to travel, um, travel with them and to tour. And that's how she became her recording. That's how her recording and music career began. So there's a picture of the young Miriam and there she is with the Manhattan Brothers. Um, and working with them is when she dropped her Fosa name, Zenzile, and became known as Miriam Makeba. Because of her talent and because there were so few women who were singing or women, singing was really looked down upon. So she became one of the few and most successful recording artists in South Africa and was fortunate enough to even travel to countries in Southern Africa going as far as Congo and what was then Northern and Southern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe and Zambia today. Her career was so successful that in that period, from the period of about 1952 when her career started till about 1959, she recorded over 120 songs with the Manhattan Brothers and an all-female group that she led called the Skylarks. Cause Mil Miriam, you know, attracted a lot of publicity, you know, in newspapers and magazines. She did theater productions. And because of this vis visibility, in 1957, she entered the world of film when she was asked to play a part in a documentary film that was being shot underground uh, by an American filmmaker named Lionel Rogerson. Rogerson, excuse me. Sorry, Miriam only sang two songs. Sorry, Nomsa, sorry to interrupt you again. Um, we can't see our PowerPoint. Do you have yes. the slide? Have you, do you want to share your screen? Because we can't see your slides currently. Okay, there we go. So if you change, if you go to slideshow and uh, present that way. Yeah. Mm. Perfect. Okay, so that's where I started everybody. Can you see that? Yes very first page with Miriam at different stages of her career um, when she first started. Then I went on to the second slide where I was just talking about her birth and her beginnings, um, about her community life, her family life growing up with Mav Vilakazi. Yeah. Mm. There she is, the young Miriam. With the Manhattan brothers. Okay. Hello? Yeah, these images are lovely. Yeah, so just following along. So we'd, we'd see, we've heard about this meeting, haven't we? Okay. 
Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So um, I was saying yes. Then she began her career with the Manhattan Brothers. Sorry about that, everybody. No, no, it's absolutely fine. And there, there we go again. Technology is really getting the best of me. But there I she was later that. with the as a as a theatre star. I mean, just starring in uh, stage productions and then an album cover of hers with the Skylarks, which was an all woman band. Can you see that? Through yes. her appearance, yes, yes. Through her, appearan her appearance um, on Come in Come Back Africa, the film, Miriam was invited to attend um, the Venice Film Festival in 1959. Um, that was when she left the country for the first time. The left, not the country, she had left the country before touring in Southern Africa, but that was when she left the continent and her, her first time overseas. Uh, at the Venice Film Festival, uh, Comeback Africa won the Critics Award and Miriam Makeba was very well received and got a lot of publicity around that. On the next stage of her, her journey to promote Comeback Africa, she went to London. While at the BBC studios in London, she met Harry Belafonte. Belafonte was so impressed by her and he assisted, he helped her to make her way to America. He was responsible for helping her get her visas and that's how she landed in America in 1959. Landing in America in 1959, her first appearance was on the Steve Allen show, a variety show which attracted over 60 million people. From there on, the upmarket up venues in New York, such as the Village Vanguard and the Blue Angel in uh, Greenwich Village. And through that, she would begin to meet a whole lot of people from Nina Simone to Marlon Brando. So that was Miriam's introduction into the world of celebrity in America. This was 1960. And these are also some of her images from Comeback Africa, the two minutes she did in the film. She was there. Um, this is what you know, attracted the world to her. Um, or what made a good impression to everybody. Um, 1960 was, you know, a very dramatic year for Miriam and for South Africa. In, oh, sorry about that. I've missed, I've missed a page of my PowerPoint, but a um, few tech glitches. In 1960, there was unrest in South Africa, Mr. Page there. In early 1960, on March 21st, there was um, anti-pass anti and anti-apartheid protests that ended in, in what was called the Sharpeville Massacre. Many people lost their lives and there was total outrage across the world because of this violence that was taking place in South Africa. Miriam at the time was still in America doing her career and uh, gaining success and worldwide rec and recognition as far as you know, she could, building a career. The fact though that she was from South Africa meant that at every performance, they would ask her, people would ask her what was happening in South Africa and she'd have to answer for it. All this, all, all this meant that she would be on public plat platforms answering to the situation in South Africa. Because of this, and sadly in her own life, in 1960, her own mother passed away. When Miriam tried to return to South Africa for her mother's funeral, her South African passport was revoked and she was not able to return to South Africa. This uh, the statelessness and the taking away of her passport and her right to travel is that she couldn't go home and she'd have to make a living in America. 
Along with that, being friends with Harry Belafonte or having Be Be Harry Belafonte as her protege or, or being Harry Belafonte's protege since he had taken, uh, taken over her career and supported her. Miriam also started coming into contact with black activists such as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and ended up performing alongside fellow musicians such as Odetta and Nina Simone who she could see using their craft as a tool of activism. All this awoke Miriam up to the reality that she too could use her stage and her platform as a performer to speak out against injustice. So we go backwards a bit, but um, there's Miriam there, some images of her for early days in America. You know, her first, some of her first publicity photos, and there she is with Harry Belafonte. Um, you know, um, you know, we keep saying Miriam was, one can confidently say, one of the first Black African women artists to make a name for herself in South Africa. What she did was she flaunted her African identity. She kept her natural look. She kept her, her songs. She, with her songs, obviously, she, song, song, she sang songs in the languages of South Africa, in Zulu, in Kosa, in Sutu. So while she, while she was a bit of a novelty, was able to de demystify any perceptions people might have had of the continent or what to expect from the continent. Aside from what was happening in South Africa with Sharpeville, 1960 had also been declared the United Nations Year of Africa. In that year, 17 countries had gained independence from colonial rule, and so Africa was in the news. So with the news from South Africa, with what was happening in the rest of the continent, and Miriam just being in America in that space and time, she became a focal point. She guarded more media attention. She became a symbol of Africa. You see her there in her African outfits. Um, in the corner, those are some of the leaders of African countries that eventually became free in the 1960s and going on, going on into the 70s and 80s. Because of this, you know, independence coming to the rest of the continent, Miriam also soon started getting acquainted with African liberation leaders who would often travel to the United Nations headquarters in New York to petition for freedom and liberation of their countries. And it was through her encounters with this community of Africans in America that Miriam received her first invitation to return to the continent. This, you know, after having her passport taken away from her. So in 1962, Miriam was able to travel to, Tanz to Kenya first, and then ultimately to Tanzania, where she met Julius, President Julius Nyerere, who gave her honorary citizenship of his country and a passport. This passport, ironically, would be the first of nine other passports from different countries that Miriam would receive in her life in exile. To highlight her profile as an African artist, Miriam was the only African artist invited to perform at the launch of the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Just being with African liberation leaders and being amongst other leaders of the Organization of African Unity, all this awoken, in, awoke, awakened, excuse me, awakened in Miriam, the spirit of Pan-Africanism pan and a sense of the value of African unity. And this again would be something that she'd valued throughout her life. 
you know, through her travels and later in life, she'd get to meet African me leaders like Kenneth Kaunda, who she's in the picture there, play, uh, played the piano and she's seen there with him accompanying her in the background. Obviously, she, this would be a chance later in life, she'd meet people like Samora Michelle and his wife, Grasha Michelle, over here. And as a voice of South Africa, would meet the South African president in exile, Oliver Tambo, Oliver Tambo, many times throughout her career. Miriam, um, while she carried on singing and achieving great success and recording in America, that's how you could put it. And because of her celebrity, you know, other African activists, South African activists invited her or encouraged her to speak on their behalf at the United Nations before the Decolonization Committee. Miriam, Miriam's speech obviously attracted great attention, which was good for the movement and just for exposing the horrors that were happening in South Africa, in apartheid South Africa. In 1964, she spoke of the, um, spoke in 1963, and then in, again in 1964, she was invited to speak before the United Nations Special Committee on Apartheid and called on all leaders of the world to boycott South Africa. Because of this back home in South Africa, not only had they banned her from returning home, but now they banned her music. So anyone in South Africa who was caught listening to Miriam Makeba's music, well, was considered doing was considered to be doing something illegal, but this didn't stop Miriam. Instead of, she continued to use her platform and every public platform she could, and in later years would speak of the United Nations again in the seventies, and in, even become uh, serve as a delegate to the U, to the United Nations in later years. Now, I don't know if you'll hear me, but um, please do let me know, because this is a snippet. No, I don't, I don't think we can hear that one. Okay, all right. So there's definitely, uh, I'm, that was Miriam Makeba, um, General Assembly, and she was 28 years old at the time, but she used the opportunity to speak out against injustice. She would speak again in 1964 and then follow up her presentation and then follow up again in the 70s. That's her speaking out against, against apartheid in those later years. During her, uh, oh, going to fast for myself. Um, what was important about Miriam Makeba was that even before she arrived in America, even before she got these international platforms, Miriam Makeba in South Africa often used her stage and her platform as a performer to sing out against injustice. A fellow South African singer, songwriter, Dorothy Masuka, they, songs, they sang songs like Kauleza, which was an alert to everyone, hurry up, the police are coming. It was a, a song that became very popular in the townships and people always, politics, Music and politics were always strongly linked. And Miriam Makeba knew that and she harnessed that. By the time she got to America, as her popularity grew and she won a Grammy Award, she was one of the first, she was the first African woman to win a Grammy Award for an evening with Miriam Makeba and Harry Belafonte in 1966. 
1967, when her, world, when her song Pata Pata became a worldwide hit, she knew that every time she got media attention or a stage to speak on, this was her opportunity to, de to declaim and lambast the horrors of apartheid. Um, there was another clip to go, but um, I don't know if we'll play, we should give it a try and see if we'll have any luck with it this time. This was um, Miriam Makeba singing Kauleza. Yeah, I think that one is, is uh, very faint also. Okay. Uh, this is very unfortunate. I'm so sorry, everybody. But the song is called Kauleza about the townships. But we'll move on. So I've termed that to songs of resistance. Okay. Aside from his songs of resistance, I also wrote that Miriam Makeba sang songs for bridging divides. Part of that bridging of divides was with her going out to learn songs in different languages. As she had learned when she was growing up, song and music was a powerful form of, con of communication. And so Miriam Akeba learned to sing songs in different languages, from Swahili to French to Portuguese. And obviously, by the time she moved to return to Africa, because in 1969, she left America after having spent a nine, 10 years there, and she relocated to Guinea Conakry with her then husband, who was a Trinidadian American civil rights activist, Stokely Carmichael. In Guinea, she also learned to sing the indigenous languages of that country. And what language taught her was that no matter what, what music taught her, the power that she learned was that no matter what language she was singing in, she could communicate with different people. And her message on stage was always South Africa, South Africa must be free, Africa must be free. I say here that Miriam Makeba recognized the power of music and she harnessed it. And I really believe she did. And it was something she did from her youth and throughout her career. I further say that Miriam Makeba became a voice of hope and her songs, whether dance songs or ballads, became synonymous with the spirit of freedom. So this is the level of, you know, she was consciously from a person who started singing for the joy of music. She took on the mantle of singing with a message, singing songs that she knew would send a message out to the world that South Africa was in trouble and South Africa needed to be saved. And that's what she did for most of her life. In this beautiful clip here, she is being interviewed and I would venture to play it again, but if we're gonna have sound problems, I can tell you about it. Here, she basically speaks. Um, um, long sir. Yes. Hi, somebody has given a suggestion in terms of how you can uh, share the sound. So where you have the screen share, if you click there, there should be somewhere that you can share the, the Yeah, so hopefully. You can hear the audio share. Yes, yeah. I tried um, share sound. That might work. Let's see. Um, There is really no difference in, in, in the, uh, the struggle between the people you have mentioned because we are all Africans. We were just put in different countries by 
white people who took the people from Africa and spread them out. And it is true that our problems are the same. Now, th saying that they are a minority, this really means nothing because the white man, wherever he is, whether he is in the majority or the minority, he rules. It just shows you, if, if to, it just proves to everyone that we just have to keep fighting. We just have to fight that much more because it doesn't matter whether he's majority or minority, he's always on top. Which status are you aiming to between the whites and the Africans at the end, when you have won? That will depend on them. We are not worried about them. We are just worried about ourselves. It is our country. They came from Europe to invade our country. They took it. They have made us suffer. So we don't have to worry about thinking what will we do to them or what will happen to them. It will be up to them to see fit what they can do when we have won. Liberate ourselves. What will happen after that will depend again on uh, the invaders. They could have come to our country and live side by side with us. We didn't mind that. In fact, when they came, we said, "Come in, sit down," and they sat down and said, "Get out." And now it is. It will. It will be up to them. It is known that Africa only had black people. Europe had white people. Asia had yellow people. Now, it is absurd to say that we Africans were not in Africa when white people first came. And secondly, the conqueror writes history. They came, they conquered, and they wrote. Now, you don't expect people who came to invade us to write the truth about us. They will always write negative things about us. And they have to do that because they have to justify their invasion in all the countries. It's like saying when the, uh, the Europeans went to America, there were no Indians there. It's ridiculous because they were there. I know that my people were there. We don't write our history. It has always been handed down to us orally by our elders. Of course, the white man came, came and he writes history. In fact, you don't know anything about any place until the white man gets there. Like my husband always says, it's like saying, well, whenever the, until the white man comes to any place, nothing lives. It's only when he comes and say, boof, I've discovered you, now you exist, which is ridiculous. And that is why I have to say the things I say in my performances, because I know, again, that I am right. And because I am right, I know I will win, because the truth shall never be covered by lies. So, um... As I said, you know, Miriam Makeba, and this is what I think is so beautiful about her and the courage it took for somebody who was exiled from the country of her birth to continuously speak out at great risk to herself and a great risk to her family because of her courage. I'll say she was also invited many times to headline platforms that were about creating solidarity, unity, and collaboration between Africans and Africans in the diaspora. And she'd often headline festivals, which became quite a major thing in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the 80s. As such, she, she, she performed a major festivals like the Pan-African Cultural Festival, in Algeria in 1969. She was there at the Rumble in the Jungle with Muhammad Ali in 1974. 
And then at the Festival of the Arts in Lagos, Nigeria in 1977. These were important initiatives because they were, it was about Africa and the African diaspora coming together through arts and culture to talk about issues of freedom, self-determination and liberation of our peoples. And I think Miriam was always at the forefront of, of events like that. That was how she saw freedom. And she continued to sing for freedom until the dawn of democracy in South Africa in 1994 and beyond. What I say is that Miriam Makeba truly, truly recognized the power of culture and music. She traveled the world and her career pro progressed. She really felt that music could be a unifying and healing force in the quest for freedom. What I think was under, what underscored though her visibility was her embracing her African culture and her identity and sticking strong to that. And that is why she could stand proud dressed in her boo-boos or dashikis with her short African hair, her turbans or her braided hair. That's why her identity and her languages and languages of other people became very important to her. So whether she was using her music or whether it was an opportunity to be in a film like Come Back Africa or several documentary films that she was in, whether it was the courage to write, to contribute to books, Miriam Makeba always used her platform as a celebrity to speak out against injustice. And I think that's a very fundamental part of her legacy, which makes her the great woman that she is today. Um, she, she lived a very difficult life in a sense with great highs. You know, um, of course, who else? The first African to win a Grammy award, number one, I mean, high, a chart topping hits in America with Pata Pata, but she also had terrible lows. Like she was never able to return from when she was banned from going back to going home, when she was banned from South Africa in 1960. She was only ever return, able to return to the country of her birth in 1990 after the release of Nelson Mandela. While in exile, she lost her only daughter and a grandson, who today are still buried, who st are still buried in Guinea Conakry. While she managed to travel the world and build a sort of career for herself, she managed to release over 20 albums and she'd receive her second Grammy nomination in 2000 after she had returned to South Africa. Her statelessness, was acknowledged by many African leaders and European leaders around the world. And she ultimately ended up with nine passports, nine travel documents, citizen, honorary citizenship from nine countries, ranging from Cuba, uh, that is, you know, that is a powerful legacy, I believe. And when she finally made it home to South Africa, an acknowledgement of the way she had served her country and fought for the freedom of South Africa, Miriam Makeba was made an honorary, was made South Africa's official goodwill ambassador to Africa, a position that had never been there before. So this was an acknowledgement of the 30 years that she had spent away from home speaking out wherever she could against injustice in South Africa and injustice around the world. Sadly, Miriam Makeba passed away on the 9th of November, 2008. But what is most significant and you know, uh, always emotional is that Miriam Makeba died shortly after stepping off the stage doing a performance in which she had sung, the last song she sang was a song which had made her, which had made her famous in 1955, in 1965, Pata Pata. 
That was the last song she sang and she collapsed as she walked off the stage at a concert in Italy. Maria Makeba touched many lives and contributed to the freedoms of many people. And the fact that she got, got the title Mama Africa is no, was no accident at all. It was by design and it was by sacrifice and it was by thinking of the larger freedoms of everybody else and the unity of our continent. As we've struggled with songs throughout, I will with um, courage <laughs> see if I can play out with what I believe was a song very symbolic of what Miriam Makeba stood for. Cheers, you know, which I wouldn't mind going back to if you missed. This was Miriam Makeba in her later years, Mama Africa. And I've lost her, but I will find her for you and play out with what I believe was one of her. Sorry, volume. Oh, I've lost you again, but we will get it right. Was the volume turned up? It looked like it was turned down. Okay. All right, I'll turn it off and we will try it one more time. Just for, for good value. For good measure. Everybody for patience. And I hope at least my people, my people, open your eyes and answer the call of the drum. Freely more, freely more. Summer a machine, summer a machine. Okay, it's starting to freeze now. Sorry for the abrupt end to that. Thank you, everybody. That was my presentation on Miriam Makeba.
just a few snippets of her life, where her career started, some of her achievements, and what I believe was some of her vision and what she fought for and what she understood. Um, back to the title of, of the presentation, Songs of Freedom, Songs for Africa. Though she sang songs for Africa, I really believe she also sang songs for the world because freedom and equality was that important to her. Thank you so much for listening.